In this video tutorial, we're going to talk about converting non-responsive projects in Adobe Captivate to responsive design. Uh, first of all, I want to say that when this feature was released in Adobe Captivate 2017, uh, it was kind of positioned as a one-button solution to this problem. And I just want to say, don't believe the hype. There is quite a bit of work that needs to be done when you're converting a project over from a non-responsive uh, design over to responsive. Uh, but the good news is, of course, is that this feature edition in Captivate 2017 does take a lot of the copying and pasting that previously would have been required uh, to make this work. It does eliminate all of that. What you're going to probably encounter is you're going to probably run into projects that were originally developed in Captivate 6 or possibly Captivate 7. And you might be asking yourself, what does that mean to you? Well, that means that in all likelihood, the developer, which could be you, I know in my case, I made these sorts of shortcuts, uh, but the developer of those original projects um, may not have considered things like object styles, or uh, they may not have uh, spent the extra time it took to ensure that the master slides contained all of the objects and the layouts and the colors that would have been necessary. In other words, they wouldn't have saved this as a theme. Um, and of course, if you're dealing with a project that's 75 to 100 slides long, uh, your first instinct might be to, to simply start with slide one and start converting these uh, slides over to individual uh, fluid box design or individual breakpoint style fluid uh, breakpoint style responsive design. Um, I would suggest that this is the perfect opportunity to incorporate themes, which of course are those items that you're going to find on your master slides and those. Uh, default object styles that you can include as part of your theme. So let's take a look at this project here. Now this is a project that I did for one of my former employers. It's about five years old and uh, at the time of course uh, I was just starting to uh, ensure that I was following some of the best practices of using master slides and and saving uh, object styles. And this would be the first thing I would look at. So if you're looking at a project such as this one here, you might want to take a look at the master slide and see if those sorts of elements have been incorporated into master slides. Uh, in particular, I'd, I'd suggest that you want to look at uh, question slides in particular, because of course all of these elements uh, will need to be populated uh, when you apply this new uh, responsive design project to your old content. And of course, uh, here you've got about eight, nine, ten different uh, master slides. It's much easier to create um, updated versions of these master slides when there's only, you know, a handful of them to work with, as opposed to the hundreds of slides that might be in a course. So my best practice or my best recommendation to you would be to spend some time making sure that you're building a proper theme. The other advantage of doing that, of course, is that when you're working for a stakeholder or a client and they realize that you're putting in the extra effort to make a quality conversion, you're very likely going to be asked back to do the additional work on other projects as they come due. So let's take you through the process. I'm going to go back to film strip view here. Here's uh, this particular project. The first thing you want to do is go to the file drop down menu and select save as responsive. You're going to see this pop up window and it's going to offer you the opportunity to show unsupported items that are in this project. Of course, if you were designing the way I was designing five years ago, you might encounter things like uh, rollover slidelets, or uh, you might have uh, animated effects, text effects, things like that. All of that stuff, unfortunately, is not supported, uh, or many of those items are not supported in HTML5, which, of course, is the basis of responsive design. So you're going to want to check for that. Um, if I select on the option to show those items, I'll see the HTML5 tracker, and of course, it would list any of those items in this panel 
for me to address. I could click on them and be brought immediately to those pages. And then of course I have a decision to make. Do I want to replace those objects with something that is supported in HTML5 or maybe I simply delete them. It depends on, on how crucial they are to the actual learning itself. Once you've addressed all of those issues, go to the File drop-down menu, Save as Responsive, click on the Save option, and give your project a new file name, uh, usually an, an additional version number, or in this case here, I'm just going to call it Responsive Captivate Project, and save over a previous version of that. So your old project will close and it will load the new version, the newly saved responsive version of that project. And again, I, I want to emphasize, don't think that you're done. Uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to go into this particular project to make it truly um, a proper and functioning responsive design project. Here's a relatively simple slide that I'll use as an example for this tutorial here. Uh, but one of the things you're going to want to look at is you're going to look at the entire course. Take a look at different slides and see how the particular design and layout has occurred. As you can see here, for the most part, I'm pretty much a designer who designs a flat interface. Uh, you'll see that with the exception of some uh, feedback captions, a lot of this stuff is tiles, which is actually very appropriate for fluid boxes. However, if I was designing uh, with a lot of overlapping objects or objects that appeared over top of other objects at various points along the timeline, I might want to consider taking the additional step of um, going to project and switching to breakpoint mode, in which case I would take these very same objects and change their position properties on the position panel. Things like, you know, how many pixels tall they are, how many pixels wide they are, or what percentage of the, of the stage do these objects take up, and, you know, how far away are they from other objects, and so on. Personally, I'm looking forward to converting my older courses into fluid box designs, because I think, you know, number one, as I've indicated, most of my designs are a fairly flat look and feel, and I think they'll lend themselves well to fluid boxes. But rather than dealing with this slide by slide, this is a 46 slide course. So that would be, you know, uh, 46 times however long it takes me to prepare one of those slides. I think it makes more sense to work on your master slide first, where you have you know, maybe nine or 10 master slides, set them up to have certain defaults that use fluid boxes, and then return to the slides and make a couple of small changes to each of the objects that, that appear on those particular slides. So I'm gonna work with this one slide for the purposes of this demonstration. And you can see here, I have a background. Now, in this particular instance, this background is a static background. It's 800 by 600. Um, if I was to stretch this across the full width of, say, 1024 by 627, uh, a lot of these objects would become uh, distorted. So I'm actually going to update this background, and I'll be using this throughout this particular project. But for starters, I'm just going to go ahead and delete that background. And I'm going to start by getting rid of some of the objects that I don't need on here. I don't need these default uh, placeholders. I am going to keep the title and the course name on this particular slide, or master slide, if you will. But I'm going to start by creating some fluid boxes here. I'm going to go with vertical, and I'm going to choose a placeholder or fluid box for my course title, my slide title, the content space, some navigation controls perhaps, and maybe space for the closed captioning along the bottom. Of course, each course is different. You're going to find that uh, certain designs won't necessarily uh, work for all different courses, but I think for this particular course, I think this will work fine. So I'm just going to reposition these uh, dividers between my fluid boxes so that they're, they're laid out appropriately here. And my navigation area will be this area down here. Actually, before we do anything else, let's take this opportunity to, to convert the size 
from the 800 by 600, which seemed very appropriate five years ago, and go with just sort of the standard project size that I think we've all become, become accustomed to. 1024 by 627. And we'll choose desktop from the preview here so we can see the full size of this. Now I've already gone ahead and gone to this organization's website and found that uh, cloud background. And I'm going to use that as my background for uh, all of these slides or many of these slides. So I'm going to select the parent level fluid box and go to the options tab. And we're going to go to the image fill section. And I'm going to go find that particular image. I have it on my desktop here. Um, and we'll just bring that in. Of course, that's going to fill this background quite nicely. And, uh, you know, so that you don't distort the image, I recommend that you go with uh, a center alignment, which means that uh, the center of the image will remain in the center of whatever screen size you're using. Uh, you can leave tile on. Tile will uh, not really affect this because, of course, I've sized this particular uh, image to be exactly 1024 by 627. Uh, but that's going to work for this particular style and design here. And uh, now, of course, when I resize this, it's not going to distort the, uh, the background image. Um, oh, I thought I selected the center alignment. Let's make sure I do that. That's what I'm really looking for in this particular case there. Yeah, I've got it set for left. Let's go with center. So now what happens is it's going to pull in from both sides at the same and keep, you know, this little cloud here will always be in the middle. So that's, uh, that's all well and good. We have our various objects that we can now drag into those fluid boxes. So there's the course title. And we need the placeholder for the slide title that will go in here as well. I'm going to keep the cloud blue for the background up here, but we're going to create some uh, some different uh, choices for these individual fluid boxes. Um, best way to do that is to select uh, one of our fluid boxes here. And we'll go into the Options tab, and we'll set that at 100% opaque. And do the same thing for this one. So that will fill in quite nicely. Similar to what we had before, but again, because it is Fluid Box, it will look a little bit different. Uh, actually, in this case here, I'm going to change the fill of the bottom to simulate that bar that we previously saw before. So now we have uh, a new slide style and you can make further refinements. Now let's go back to the film strip here and uh, take a look at this particular slide again. So now I have all these objects here and um, I have some choices that I can make. So the first thing I think I'm going to do is just move these off into the scrap area temporarily just because um, you know, at this particular instance, I want to think about what I'm going to do with this particular slide. So I have these three columns that are four tiles high. And we're just going to move these key points. Now these are key points that are uh, displayed on screen when the narration uh, comes to those particular points. And I think what I'll do is I'll select this, you know, I've got the fluid boxes for my master slide. But I'm going to select this content area and I'm going to set up some fluid boxes that are specific just for this slide to accommodate the content that's here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make four columns. And what we're going to do from there is further divide up each of these into um, vertical choices that include four fluid boxes within each one here. And if you're unsure about fluid boxes, I have several videos that deal with fluid boxes. I recommend that you check those out. Get an idea of how you can work with different wrap styles, 
different alignment points and, and really get a handle on what fluid boxes can do for you. So let's start putting some of these objects in these fluid boxes. By dividing this up, I'm ensuring that you know the layout's going to work for my particular design here. Again, I'm kind of going at this backwards a little bit because again, we started off with a non-responsive project five years ago that now we're trying to make into a fluid box design. So there are going to be certain compromises that have to occur, uh, but I think we can make this work quite nicely. So now I have all these images over here. I can really only use four of them if I want this particular slide to be somewhat symmetrical. So maybe we'll delete some of these that we won't be using. Uh, you know, and maybe I would put some greater consideration than what I'm doing right now. I'm just randomly picking four that might work. And what we'll do is we'll put those in these first column of fluid boxes. And of course, with images, you're going to want to uh, maintain the aspect ratio because otherwise it will distort these person's images and so forth. But with regards to these uh, smart shapes, we can actually uncheck fluid boxes and have these elements fill their particular fluid boxes. And then we can set some other settings for the fluid boxes to allow for things like white space through the use of the padding feature. And that's going to help out quite a bit here. But I think you're starting to see how, you know, it won't take very long to convert uh, the master slide to accommodate the, the basics. And then you just do some small tweaking to the actual slide itself to deal with this. Now, of course, these back and next buttons will need to be dragged into their respective fluid box, which is this one down here. And that will change their size. We'll play with some of the settings to make those uh, a more appropriate size. But we're pretty much in the home stretch here. Uh, we could, of course, choose this fluid box, go back to the style tab, and maybe squeeze these in a row because I don't want them to wrap to the next row. And for uh, alignment, we could actually just put some space around them just to give them a little bit of individual space. And using things like the padding feature, we can, of course, uh, set up so that they kind of return to what they previously were sized at. And that looks pretty good. Let's just do a preview of this slide here. Again, it's going to take, um, you know, quite a few days uh, for you to convert uh, a non-responsive project into responsive. But I dare say that the improvements over how you would have had to have done this, say, a year ago or two, uh, you're probably saving quite a few days in the redevelopment process of a non-responsive to responsive design project here. So let's just take a look at what this looks like. So in this particular example, we'll have some objects slide in and appear in time with some narration, which we're not currently hearing, but uh, trust me, it is there. And of course, as these objects come in, uh, they won't interfere with each other. And of course, uh, depending on how you set up your fluid boxes to wrap, uh, these objects will appear on, on screen at various times. And it works kind of well. As you can see at the time, I was kind of inspired by Windows 8 when it came out. So that gives you a sense of when this particular course was built. Um, but, you know, this is sort of the uh, style that I was going for a few years ago. Uh, and it works well. I, I really am opposed to regular bullet points. So I kind of went with this tiled approach, which just works out to be absolutely convenient when it comes to converting to um, a fluid box design. The, I, I obviously would need to spend more time adding some finesse to this particular project here. But, uh, but essentially, that would be my process, would be focusing on building a, a fully responsive design theme with all of the, uh, the object styles in place, as well as, of course, the uh, master slides set up so that I could do the bulk of my work on my master slides and then just do some small revisions to the individual slides themselves, saving me perhaps many days worth of redesign work.
If you thought this video was useful, please share it with your colleagues. If you need help with your next e-learning project, consider hiring me. My focus is to create effective e-learning that helps you achieve your business goals. Visit my website at paulwilsonlearning.com, follow me on Twitter at paulwilsonld, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel.